Hello, and thank you to every one of you for joining today's emergency ACLU Town Hall. I'm Rebecca Lowell Edwards, Chief Communications Officer at the ACLU, and I'll be your moderator today. In Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, Mississippi is asking the Supreme Court to not only uphold their 15-week abortion ban, but also to overturn Roe v. Wade entirely. The Supreme Court is expected to make a final decision by the end of June. But after a draft opinion by Justice Samuel Alito was leaked on Monday, our worst fears were confirmed. The Supreme Court is indeed ready to revoke the right to abortion. We at the ACLU, along with our coalition partners, have been planning for the overturning of Roe for months, but we are still grappling, grappling with the horrifying prospect that millions of people across the country would be forced to remain pregnant against their will. Over the next hour, we will discuss one, what the leaked decision signals about the Supreme Court's ultimate opinion, two, what it means for reproductive freedom across this country, three, what it says about the state of the Supreme Court and the justices, and four, how the ACLU is fighting back and where we could use your help. So let's dive right in. We are going to hear today from four incredible legal and advocacy experts. I'd like to ask them to quickly join me on screen. Bridget, Michelle, David, and JJ, welcome. And thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insights and response plans to Monday night's opinion leak. First up, I'd like to start with Bridget and Michelle and we'll see you, David and JJ, in a little bit. Bridget O'Meary is Deputy Director of the ACLU's Reproductive Freedom Project, and I'm very excited to also welcome Michelle Goodwin. Michelle is an ACLU National Board Member and the Chancellor's Law Professor at the University of California, Irvine. I'm so thankful to have you both join us today. Thank you so much, Becky. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, it's very good to be in community with both of you. All right, I'm going to dive right in because we want to fit a lot into this one hour together. So I'm starting with you, Bridget, with a quick question. I think it's important to start with the fact that this is just a draft opinion, right? Absolutely. And we want to make clear that it's just a draft opinion is not the final decision by the Supreme Court. We hope that in the final decision that the Supreme Court does not overturn Roe versus Wade, but we absolutely want to make, care, make clear that for people who have abortion appointments now that you can get care. This does not change anything right now. And so that is critically important for people to understand. Thank you for that clarity. All right, I'm sticking with you for a second. If the Supreme Court's ultimate opinion does look like the draft we've now seen, what does that mean for reproductive freedom across this country? it will be devastating. If the Supreme Court does overturn Roe versus Wade, almost immediately about half the states will ban abortion. Millions of people will be unable to get abortion care. Those with resources will be able to travel, but it will be long distances that they'll have to travel because huge parts of the state will lose access to abortion completely. Those without resources or the ability to travel will be forced to remain pregnant against their will and carry their pregnancies to term and give birth against their will. This will be devastating for people, especially people who are in marginalized communities. And I know we're gonna talk about the devastating consequences a little bit later. It's a perfect segue. And actually, this is where I wanna to turn to Michelle. I have a similar question for you. Can you talk to us a bit about who would be most impacted by the overturning of Roe? I'm so happy that we're having this conversation at the ACLU because the ACLU leads in so many ways to protect civil liberties and civil rights. And here it's important that we center concerns around the most vulnerable of people in America, women, girls, people who have the potential to become pregnant. You know, to be, to be clear here, we're seeing an arc of history um, that hasn't died, an arc of slavery and Jim Crow that now morphs its way into a Jane Crow. That is to say that we saw during times of antebellum slavery, people who were kidnapped and trafficked to the United States 
forced into reproduction and being pregnant against their will for means of private people to capitalize off of their labor and reproduction. And even banks as black women were bought, mortgaged, leased and sold. We saw then that our transfer into the early 20th century where for vulnerable white women largely and then later women of color, uh, periods and patterns of coercive sterilization, the infamous Mississippi appendectomy that Fannie Lou Hamer famously talked about. And now we're in a space in which in the state of Mississippi already, there's only one abortion clinic that remains. In many states, given the way in which abortion rights have already been gerrymandered, there's one abortion clinic or just a few in a state such as in the state of Texas. And the result ends up being exactly what Bridget mentioned, which is a coercive force of people having to remain pregnant against their will. And pregnancy is not something that is necessarily safe. You know, the rate of death pregnancy compared to abortion is that a person is 14 times more likely to die by carrying a pregnancy to term than by having an abortion. And when we look at these matters, according to race and socioeconomics, it is a death sentence. And that's a framing that sounds alarming, but it is alarming. The United States ranks between 50th and 54th in the world in terms of maternal mortality. And nationally, Black women are three and a half times more likely to die due to maternal mortality than their white counterparts. But Becky, what's also important for us to know is that those figures dramatically increase when we look at Mississippi, mm -hmm. Texas, Louisiana, and states like that. When we peer into certain counties and cities, that rate of death is five times, 10 times, 15 times more likely death than white counterparts carrying pregnancies to term and just after childbirth. So those are important aspects of the conversation and I know we'll further unpack all of these issues. So thank you very much. I appreciate you both for centering your responses in, in humanity and in, in the individuals who have suffered and will suffer uh, if, if Roe is overturned. I wanna peer a little bit more personally um, into what you both are thinking. You've dedicated your careers to the constitutionality, to the constitutionally protected right to abortion. How are you fueling your fight in this moment? I'd like to start with you, Michelle. Well, you know, these have been long days, um, not just since the leak of the draft opinion penned by Justice Alito. When I read that opinion, though, it's stunning for so many reasons, not only because in that draft opinion, we see the full dismantling of Roe and Planned Parenthood v. Casey. We see citations to treatises. And in these treatises, these were treatises that um, allowed for marital rape. Uh, treatises that were referred to by legislatures and also by courts to fashion women as property of their husbands and girls as property of their fathers. These are treatises that were relied upon when states continued to sanction marital rape and allow for men not to experience criminal punishment for doing that. These are treatises that were relied upon when judges evaluated whether fathers should be punished for the rape of their daughters and decided, well, no, because that would be disruptive to those fathers and disruptive to family harmony. And so when we read this opinion closely, it turns on its head so many notions that we have about full equality, privacy and autonomy, and about democracy and the rule of law. How much do girls and women and people who will be affected by this really count within our constitutional structure? And so when I think about this, I think about it through that lens um, professionally and also personally, because I know so many people who will be affected by this. Thank you for that, Michelle. And Bridget, what are your thoughts? The human suffering that it will cause if Roe is overturned really cannot be overstated. And so the gut punch of seeing the words on the page of potentially overturning Roe is just, even if we knew that this was a possibility and we were of course planning for this possibility, it still just takes the wind out of your body. Um, so, 
but we're, we don't give up. We keep going. And um, so the ACLU is fi firing on all cylinders. We're in overdrive in every single way. And so I just want to talk about all of that work that we're doing because we're never going to give up. We're never going to give in. And the Reproductive Freedom Project on the litigation side, we will always go to court and we will fight to protect access to abortion whenever we can in court for as long as we can in court. I was just in court in, on Monday at a preliminary injunction hearing in Kentucky saying that the right to abortion um, is protected by the Constitution and that is the law of the land today. Uh, the ACLU National and Political Advocacy Department will hear more for, from JJ in a little bit about the strategies that they're working on. They're working to pass the Women's Health Protection Act, which will protect the right to abortion in federal statutes. Um, and they're also looking at key state Supreme Court races where the battle is going to be so important at the state level. We really can't emphasize that more either. Our communications department is doing such an amazing job of uh, and. Becky, it's you and your team doing an amazing job of educating people about what it means if Roe is going to be overturned. What's the state of the law today? There's so much confusion and chaos that has existed because that's part of the design. Anti-abortion politicians fuel the chaos and the confusion on purpose. And it's up to us and up to you and your colleagues in the communication department to set the record straight so that people can know where they can get the care that they need because that information is critical to people's lives. And also our affiliates, our state affiliates are so amazing and they're doing this amazing work in coalition in their states and the local is so important for people who are looking to get involved. We encourage people to look to their local coalitions and their state ACLUs for guidance on how to get involved. And without their work, uh, this could not happen. And without this, with the support of our donors, this work couldn't happen. So really want to give a shout out to our donors. Uh, what comes next, what's happened in the past None of this is going to be easy. We are all working so hard and we cannot do this work without people's support. And certainly we couldn't do it without the support of the Guardians of Liberty, which are our monthly donors. Um, their ongoing support really means that we can do this work and without that we can't. Um, so to the Guardians of Liberty out there, thank you so much. If you're not already one, we encourage you to become one and you can go to aclu.org monthly to start giving monthly as well. Yeah, thanks um, to you both. That was a lot of wonderful information. And thank you, Bridget, for even weaving in breaking news from today, hearing about um, the fact that the Women's Health Protection Act will come to a, a vote next week. So thank you for highlighting that breaking news. Um, Bridget, this is a team effort. I mean, you listed a lot of people doing that work, um, but in the same breath, we're thanking all the ACLU supporters and activist community, many of whom are on this call with us today. And we wanna take the time because I speak for Bridget and others and, and people who are not on this call who work at the ACLU. And we wanna say thank you. Thank you to you. And, and we also wanna thank Bridget's colleagues in the Reproductive Freedom Project for everything you're doing. Um, and Michelle, of course, you, you've done so much in your academic life and in your personal life and your professional life to bring attention to this issue. And so we are with you every step of the way. Um, JJ will, in fact, be joining us soon to talk about our grassroots advocacy work. But first, I want to focus on the Supreme Court, since it is in the spotlight and it is what brought us here today to a certain extent. Michelle, stick with me, and I want to bring in David Cole, the ACLU's legal director. Okay, a quick question for you both. As constitutional scholars, how unprecedented is this leak? Could it influence the ultimate decision? Well, I'll start, perhaps. Okay, go ahead, Michelle. So, it is entirely unprecedented. Um, you know, and I think that there is something important to be said about the ability for justices to be able to uh, speak amongst each other, to be able to sharpen their tools for dissent and also majority. So it's highly unusual. But I would say that is, as Stephen Vladek has said, uh, a story, but not the story. Uh, this story is what is contained within the content of that draft opinion. And it is also the case that uh, justices will change their votes. 
that at the first stage of a draft, it may be that a certain set of just justices uh, are on one side and the majority, they may switch and move. Famously, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts did that uh, in a case involving the Affordable Care Act. So what we see today may not actually be what is the ultimate decision, but for many people, they're doubtful whether uh, what we saw substantively will actually change. Appreciate that insight. Um, David, anything you want to add before we dig into the content of, of that leak? Oh, you know, I agree. It's it's a story, not the story. It's it's unprecedented. I think it will make it harder uh, for justices to change their views. Uh, you know, justices change their views. The last time uh, whether Roe should be overturned was uh, presented in, in uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey 30 years ago, and they originally were inclined to uh, overturn it and switched positions and ultimately upheld the core of, of Roe. But that gets harder to do when it's in public, when mm -hmm. it's out there in public, um, backing off of a position that is public. Uh, uh, so, so I'm, I'm you know, not super hopeful that they're going to move back. But I agree, what's really unprecedented is the decision itself. And, and in particular, uh, the decision to essentially eliminate a constitutional right. There are times where the court um, uh, overturns prior precedents. And, and in the opinion, Justice Alito cites about 30 cases in which the court has overturned prior precedents. But what's remarkable about that list is that virtually every one of those cases involve the expansion of rights, the extension of rights to new people or to new, uh, uh, new claims, not the elimination uh, of a right. And here they are proposing, uh, if they follow through with it, to eliminate a right that fully half the country um, uh, enjoys, that's been here for uh, 50 years, that has been affirmed and reaffirmed by the court in opinion after opinion, and simply because our former president appointed three new justices who seem you know, willing to go along with uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this view. And it really, that is truly unprecedented to eliminate a constitutional right uh, like this. And, and I want, I'm glad you mentioned that because I wanted to give a plug to the um, op-ed that you wrote that the Washington Post published today on that very view. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your views on whether the Supreme Court is as political as it appears? And if so, what is our path forward to protect reproductive freedom and our other cherished rights? So, you know, it is, I, I don't know if it's as political as it, it appears, but it's certainly as conservative as it appears and uh, radically conservative. Uh, I mean, I think we've had, we've, we've lived under a, a, a sort of small C conservative court for a pretty long time, pretty much my entire career as a uh, as a as a lawyer, uh, we've had a majority conservative uh, Supreme Court, but now we have a majority radical uh, conservative Supreme Court, a, a court that is you know willing to stop President Biden's uh, requiring that people have vaccinations in order to save lives, and admits in its decision that 6,300 people may die because of its decision to stay the order. Uh, but nonetheless stays uh, the order. And, it, and a court that you know, has justices who in their first and third years on the court, uh, when most justices are kind of cautious, tread lightly, are willing to go whole hog and, and reverse uh, one of the most important uh, decisions and take away one of the most important rights uh, that women have. So it's, you know, it, it, is, it is deeply disturbing. Um, you know, whether the court will continue to be that radical uh, conservative force, I think, depends largely on us. It depends on how we respond. Um, and the same thing is true of the right to reproductive choice. Um, the, whether women continue to, uh, to, to enjoy this right will depend on us, how we respond. For 50 years, we've been able, by and large, to rely on the fact that the Supreme Court has protected this right. That is no longer the case. I think that will, it should, I hope it will, um, inspire lots of people to come forward, uh, to stand up, to organize, to speak out, uh, and to, to vote in ways that, um, that reaffirm that right to reproductive choice. And 
uh, in the long term, I think we'll get there. You know, most liberal democracies have reached a, a consensus on abortion and protect the right to abortion. Even Catholic countries like Ireland uh, do so. So if they can do so, we can do so. But only if we, who care about this right, engage and double down in our engagement, right? Absolutely, we have to double down. The, the, this, this, if, if Roe is, is erased, it will be largely because the anti-abortion forces fought and organized and voted, right, uh, uh, for 50 years to achieve this result. We have to do the same thing. And hopefully it won't take 50 years. Yeah, amen to that. Michelle, I would love to get your thoughts on the role of courts and to that last point that David was making so clearly, what is the role that we, the people can play? So I wanna answer both of those and put this again on a historical map. So you start off with a really important question about what does this mean in terms of the court itself? Well, when President Trump was in office, he was able to nominate and get through more judges, more federal judges than any other president save George Washington. And with a very clear mission that was publicly articulated at press conferences that that mission would be specifically the dismantling of Roe v. Wade, that it would be those types of judges that he would seek to place on district courts, appellate courts, and ultimately the United States Supreme Court. And to put that in context in terms of what this means and in building on what David has just mentioned, when you think about Roe v. Wade, it was a seven to two opinion. It was not even close. Five of those seven justices were Republican appointed. Prescott Bush, the father of George H.W. Bush, was the treasurer for Planned Parenthood. This gives us some sense of what the Republican values were in the 1970s, 80s with regard to reproductive freedom and liberty. It's not unusual that there's ideological uh, diversity on a court that is important so that judges are able to come with the experiences and backgrounds that they bring. But there's something very different that is being intimated, and I think uh, rightfully so, about the infection of partisanship, of kind of political partisanship making its way into the bench. And it's hard to argue against, especially as federal judges have pushed Chief Justice John Roberts to actually make a statement to say that, look, our court should be free from being aligned with any political party. And he did that during the Trump administration and said, there's no such thing as Trump judges, as Obama judges, et cetera. But that was because of so much of this kind of backlash and perhaps influence making its way onto the bench. And so we have to think about these issues, not just within the context of the Supreme Court, but also at lower level courts too, and how they will address these uh, particular issues. Now, what is it that folks can do? You know, I think it's important that we add to this conversation what's taken place at the court in advance and also after. And that is Shelby County v. Holder. The Supreme Court dismantled key parts of the Voting Rights Act. And that matters to the extent that in this draft opinion, we see Justice Alito saying, well, this can all be resolved by people just voting in their states. Well, we know through the dismantling of key provisions of the Voting Rights Act, it's made it very difficult for people to be able to vote, including the people who will be most harmed by Roe's dismantling if that occurs. Black and brown people in places like Mississippi, Texas, and other parts of the country that already had histories of being notorious in suppressing Black people's ability to vote. And in fact, have an expertise at it that dates all the way back to slavery uninterrupted during Jim Crow and now masterful at it in this era of the new Jane Crow. But there's a lot that we can also learn from in terms of the indefatigability, that strength, that joy, that commitment to rolling up our sleeves and doing the work that we saw during the civil rights movement and that we actually saw during Jim Crow. And it actually will take that same kind of commitment, courage, and and energy. I think there's something to be said that's unfair about the most vulnerable people in society having to lead the way to protect our nation's constitution and helping us to live up to our constitutional values. I often take a pause and I think about the Black mothers during the 1950s and 60s who so courageously allowed their children to be the ones who would lead the way into segregated schools. I think about the mother of Ruby Bridges. Imagine what that mother had to do thinking about her six-year-old daughter being 
marshaled into school by guards and receiving daily death threats. But this sense of a vision about our country as needing to live up to its values in its constitution. And if lawmakers couldn't do it and judges couldn't get it done, then it would be people who would do it and get it done, of course, with the aid of organizations like the ACLU. And I think that that is where we are today. And I think it's that energy that we need to turn to. And there's a lot of action then that we can talk about. Wow. Get it done. I love it. That's going to be my new slogan. I am so grateful that we could hear from both of you today. Your knowledge is so deep and you make it so accessible and even more important, actionable. So I thank you both for being here with us. You, Michelle, I really appreciate how you talked about making different communities, you know, centering the communities that are harmed when reproductive freedom is restricted and making sure that we understand with so many people affected, it's vital that we collaborate with our partners on the ground who are embedded in these very communities. And another plug, David, for your op-ed. I hope everybody on this call reads it. Okay, let's now talk about the ACLU's grassroots organizing and other advocacy to protect reproductive rights at the state and local level. I'm gonna bring back Bridget and I'm gonna introduce JJ. So JJ Strait is the Deputy Director of the ACLU's Liberty Division. Thanks so much for being here today, JJ. Uh, thank you, Becky. All right, JJ, let me start with you. Can you tell us about all the advocacy work the ACLU is doing to protect, protect reproductive rights and talk to us about how we're responding in the moment and our larger plans? Uh, absolutely. Um, I really want to just state really clearly to all our supporters on this call today, our staff and our activists, that the ACLU with our 50 state Washington DC and Puerto Rico affiliates are just incredibly uniquely positioned in this particular moment. We are the fighters and we are going to stand up to this injustice together. And how we're doing that is immediately, we've been working with our national and local partners to make sure we're driving the political advocacy and the mobilization efforts uh, across the nation. In fact, just this week with less than 24 hours notice from this leak that came to us late on Monday night, many of you hit the streets as did I, uh, to really come together and just demonstrate the out, absolute outrage and more importantly, the solidarity that we all have in this moment. We know that the way forward uh, for us to, is to galvanize this public attention, to continue to put the pressure on our elected officials to restore abortion rights. And toward that end, we were, we're gonna continue to work with national partners like Planned Parenthood and Move On and Ultraviolet. And we're looking to mobilize folks again to gather and show that solidarity coming up here on May 14th. Uh, we'll be giving you some more information about that later uh, or how to get involved. Um, you know, I also want to just underscore that there's literally no conversation about abortion that is too small in this moment. It's critical that we talk to our friends, our family, our churches, uh, and our colleagues at the, you know, everywhere we can at the coffee shop, at the soccer field, and really also share with folks on social media about what our, you know, about this moment and what our dedication is, why we are called to stand up and that we can stand up together um, and talk about why we all support abortion um, and access to healthcare. And really, I always think about, it's really important for us to paint the picture of the world we want. Uh, one where every single person in this country has access to the reproductive healthcare they need regardless of you know, the zip code they happen to fall into. Um, you know, I also wanna just mention that we've been partnering with a lot of companies, national companies that have employees across the United States or have big footprints in places where we know that abortion access is likely to be severely restricted and even banned. Um, they've really been stepping up and partnering with us on uh, efforts like don'tbanequality.com this, they've uh, been showing that it's important for all of us to use our different voices and tools to protest these laws that restrict reproductive health care, 
abortion and impact gender equality. I appreciate that um, mention of don't ban equality. And I want to also up that mention with the fact that I'm wearing my Levi's jean jacket today in honor of their great statement. So important that, as you say, we normalize abortion stories and that everyone's voice is heard, including the corporate sector. Absolutely. And we're using our voice in um, ways like uh, JJ mentioned, but we're also doing a lot of communications work and, and you know, personal privilege here since, since I am the moderator, I'm also going to interject with my head of communications hat on and mention the work that we're doing in partnership with Bridget and her team and JJ's team and also Planned Parenthood to galvanize public attention to really make the story come alive that Michelle was speaking to so elegantly earlier. The fact that what these abortion bans really mean is that politicians are taking away individual decision-making power and forcing people to stay pregnant. So we've got ads running this weekend and in the coming weeks that really we hope tell that story so people will understand this isn't at arm's length. This isn't something you can ignore. This is something that's happening to real people, our neighbors, our family members, and it's not okay for us to sit on the sidelines. Bridget, is there anything you'd like to add here? Yes, I'm talking about our partners. One of the critical things that people can do is donate to an abortion fund. And for people who don't know, abortion funds pay for people's abortions if they can't afford them. They also provide other support and as do other practical support organizations to pay for childcare, to pay for travel arrangements. So this infrastructure that already exists to help people get abortions today is going to be needed to be invested in to really build out. So we have a link to the National Network of Abortion Funds that is being dropped in the chat. And so really encourage people to take a look and donate if possible. Thanks for that. JJ, I wanna bring you back in because I know we've been doing a lot of advocacy work in the states like Michigan specifically. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the ACLU is doing there and whether what is happening there can serve as a model for other states? Uh, absolutely. Um, before I get to Michigan, I just want to start with the fact that the ACLU and all our state affiliates have been working in anticipation of this decision for months. Um, as we do every year, uh, our affiliates um, with our partnership have worked in their state legislatures to protect access to abortion. Um, just this year, states like Connecticut and Colorado uh, have worked to pass legislation that protects access. Um, and our affiliates in states like Nebraska and Virginia have been fighting legislation that would ban abortion in their states and were able to uh, stop that this year. Um, but I also want to underscore that, as we've heard from our colleagues today, this is a tremendously dark and difficult time. And we know that there are states that are going to see their access, like I said, severely restricted or even banned. Um, and it can get a little hard to have optimism, but I know that for myself and the folks who are taking time out of their day today uh, to join this call, that we are called to this work for deeply personal reasons and that um, taking our sadness and for me, the anger of this moment, because um, I'm an organizer, and I know that anger is one of the most valuable tools we have when we can direct it towards change and really invest it. And that's exactly what we intend to do. Um, as you heard earlier, we just heard breaking news this morning that the U.S. Senate leadership is planning to hold a vote on the Women's Health Protection Act. Some of you might have heard it as WIPA. <laughs> um, they're going to hold that vote again next week. And this is another moment for everybody to be heard loud and proud and constantly. Sometimes we should just put those folks on speed dial, our elected officials, and just make sure they are absolutely hearing from us. Uh, even if you think that they don't, that, it, that your voice doesn't matter or that they are likely to support this, make sure they're hearing from each and every one of us and that they need to do the right thing and pass this bill. Um, okay, let me pack, uh, Becky, let me pivot back to Michigan that you asked about, you know, I just actually got to spend two weeks in Detroit with our awesome affiliate there and our partners and 
we are in the process of gathering the signatures that we need in the state of Michigan to place a pro-choice ballot referendum right into their um, onto the ballot this November. And this would actually establish a, a constitutional right to an abortion in the Michigan constitution. This is one of a unique and first of its kind um, opportunity. And you know, the thing about it is it's a way for us to really take this directly to the voters who we know are in a you know, overwhelming majority support of abortion access and by uh, bypass those really <laughs> just out of touch politicians uh, so that we can make sure that we are um, you know, demonstrating the kind of world we wanna live in. Um, and so, I want to uh, let everybody know who's joined this call, you know, and is thinking, what can I do, and uh, how do I, how do I show up in this moment? That we really do have an opportunity to take this anger and energy um, and turn it into mobilization and engagement and meaningful action. Um, we know that reproductive rights are obviously on the line, and what this week demonstrated to us uh, <clears throat> is that uh, a, a small minority of folks are trying to take this right away and we are gonna stand up. So I want us to uh, look and think about how we can all take a pledge today and join the ACLU's People Power Network uh, to become a defender of abortion rights and for all the ways that we can continue to get involved for mobilization and information in your own state. Um, you can go to the ACLU.org uh, backslash, backslash abortion uh, dash pledge. Again, that's aclu.org backslash abortion dash pledge. This is a place for you to sign up and join us as a defender and get involved locally on all the things that we can come together and do in this moment to fight back. Thank you so much, JJ. And you're getting some help from Yusuf in the chat, by the way, oh, uh, great. to, to <laughs> capture those URLs. Yes, so, appreciate so that. Stumbled here. a little bit there. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. We gotcha. We gotcha. Um, and I'm sure every person is watching to look for some measure of hope to mix in with their anger um, as we face the shocking possibility of the end of Roe. And so I know that for me, hearing about this incredible work and, and you know, what's going, what what's possible in Michigan and what's already happened in New Jersey keeps me energized and inspired. I'm going to turn to Bridget. We started with you. So now let's bring it back to you. Um, as we look to the future of securing reproductive rights around the country, talk to us about the critical role of public opinion, public pressure, and elections. Absolutely. So You've already heard a lot about that today in terms of the people are with us. The vast majority of people in this country support access to abortion. And what is in the draft leaked opinion does not reflect our values. And so we need to make sure that our values are reflected in our elected leaders. And so as JJ was saying, you know, put your elected officials on speed dial at every level, state, local, federal, let them know where you stand on this issue and also that it's a priority to you. Even if you think that your representative is supportive of abortion, they still need to hear from you and we need to hold their feet to the fire to make this a priority issue. And the same thing with elect, electing new people, we have to make sure that we're electing people who are supportive of abortion access and will make it a priority. We also need to support our colleagues in the voting rights project because as you heard from Michelle, we can't vote people into office who reflect our values if our vote is diminished because of all of the restrictions on access to voting. So many of the issues that we work on at the ACLU are intertwined, and that includes our voting rights uh, friends who are working to make sure that our votes are meaningful and reflect our, our and we could vote people in who reflect our values. Uh, and I would also say that I, I fear things are going to get worse before they get better. And I am really aware of the other side's plan to push abortion out of reach, to overturn Roe. And if you think that they're going to stop at overturning Roe and leaving it to the states to determine whether people can have abortions, then you are mistaken. The thing that they want next is a nationwide ban on abortion. So 
I want to make sure that everyone understands that we have our fights cut out for us, both in terms of the defensive work to make sure that doesn't happen if Roe is overturned, but then also to build back to something even better than Roe. Roe was always the floor. It's not the ceiling. Roe gives the basic right to abortion, but it does not ensure access to abortion or protect other reproductive freedoms, including being able to parent in the way that everybody should be able to with the resources that they need. So I come to work every day knowing that we collectively, all working together, we can make sure that someday we will have our vision realized. The other side has their plan. We need to have our plan too and do everything that we can to make it a reality that people will have access to the care, be able to have their reproductive freedom guaranteed. And I'm so grateful to be in the fight with you. Um, and we will do everything that we can here and with you in partnership uh, to make that a reality. Okay. Uh, this is this may be a never before happened occurrence, but we are actually ahead of time. So I am going every, I mean, we have talked so much in and we have talk, extra time left. Wow. Um, we can do anything, people. Uh, okay, I'm going to ask everyone to come back, all of our speakers, and then I'm going to give them each one minute, let's say, to give some final remarks, send us off with what you would really want us to take away. How about if we start with you, Michelle? It's been a pleasure to be with you all. And in this moment, I'm thinking not just about what we see in the dismantling of Roe because it's really important, but also what we see in terms of the attacks on our rule of law and the fragility of our democracy is being tied to this. When half of the population is shut out of base, something that is basic healthcare and then shut out of the possibility to vote to be able to recenter themselves in the nation's conversation, then we're at a time where there is a crisis that's just beyond abortion, but it relates to something so much more. And so I wanna think about this within the context of reproductive justice as I close, which is that it's not just about one slice of reproductive rights. Reproductive rights is a plural. And so we're thinking about the ability to be able to have access to contraception, sex education, the ability to terminate a pregnancy, the ability with dignity to be able to carry a pregnancy to term. And so I close with thinking about Sojourner Truth and that famous speech that she had, Ain't I a Woman? And in that speech, she said, and I bore 13 children and saw nearly each one snatched from my arms and nobody heard my cry but God ain't I a woman? And in these days, I'm inspired by the fact that the ACLU hears that cry and that we've always been committed to the least amongst us, those who are the most vulnerable. And I am happy to stand with my colleagues on this call today and those of you who care very deeply about these issues in our society at these times. Thank you. Thanks for that, Michelle. David, any, any final words from you? Yeah, I think, you know, I think if you think about the history of constitutional rights in this country, what you realize is that the scope of our constitutional rights is not really determined by the Supreme Court. It's determined by us. So women were protected by the Supreme Court only after women fought uh, through uh, feminism and the women's rights movements to get that um, recognition. Uh, African Americans were, you know, only got Brown versus Board of Education and the end of forced uh, segregation by organizing and, act, and, and fighting for that right. The, the, um, mar the marriage equality was won only because uh, people who cared deeply in extending marriage to same-sex couples uh, fought uh, for a long time together in lots of different venues to, um, to, to get that right recognized. And it also goes the other way around. The, as I said before, the, the anti-abortion forces have fought for 50 years. We need to fight back just as strongly. But I think what this illustrates is that if you fight, if you organize, if you associate with like-minded people and engage in, in the struggle, you can determine the course of constitutional history and not leave it to the Supreme Court. JJ, how about you? Um, all I can say is that uh, Monday night was 
just inc as much as I've been expecting it, I've been working in this space uh, for pretty much my whole career. And uh, to have that moment, uh, you know, kind of finally happen, I don't know, it was incredibly, uh, I think uh, Bridget said it well, like, it took the wind right out of me. Um, and then Tuesday night came and I was at my state capital. I live here in Denver, Colorado, and I was with thousands of friends and, um, and strangers. <laughs> Uh, in complete solidarity and communion with one another. Um, and it just, you know, what David just said is absolutely right. Like it absolutely lifted me right back up because I know that we are going to be challenged, but we're going to rise to that challenge. And um, I'm pretty new to the ACLU and a lot of you might not know, but I had another job that I just quit with very little notice when the Texas decision came down. Mm -hmm. And I came to work here because I needed to be here in this moment at the ACLU, at an organization that fights in these moments and can bring our incredible network and resources, and most importantly, our passion um, for the world that we want. And I also wanna leave you all with a quote. I'm the granddaughter of uh, Mexican immigrants. And uh, one of my favorite quotes that gets me through in moments like this is, they did try to bury us but they did not know we were seeds. Mm. Oh my gosh. Okay, I made it all this far without crying, JJ. Um, Bridget, any last words from you? I mean, all of this just gives me so much more hope and inspiration than I had just an hour ago coming in here. So thank you so much. It's so good to be in virtual community with all of you. And I think that someone else said this too, that we're just called to this work. You know, some of my friends say to, me like how do you keep doing this like you just must be so tired and so stressful and you just have so much responsibility and I just think how can we not because if we don't things are going to get even worse and then they're never going to get better so it's incumbent upon us and I take that as a real honor and a privilege to come to work every day to do this work and to do this work with all of you and so I'm going to keep going so I hope you all do too because I believe that we can make things better Whew. thank you Thank you to Shamika, our ASL interpreter, and Bridget, Michelle, David, and JJ for having this conversation with me and for your tireless work to protect our civil liberties and civil rights every day. I am honored and proud to be in this fight with you. And it has been a great pleasure to bring this community together to hear all of your thoughts. I also wanna thank you all who have come today on very short notice, because you do so much. You joined us today, but you join us on many other moments before today, and we count on you to join us in future moments. We could not meet this critical moment with so much force and impact without the help of you, our incredible donors and activists. You are essential partners in this fight for reproductive freedom and in the fights, all of the fights for other critical freedoms that we defend. We deeply appreciate your continued support, engagement and activism. Please take all the actions we mentioned today and we look forward to keeping you updated on our work. Goodbye for now and thank you.